you've been following along with us for the last several months, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew and looking at different things that we could learn about Jesus, and we'd finally gotten to the place over the last month or so. We were dealing with the parables that uh, were found in Matthew 22, 3, 4, and 5, and uh, what Jesus had to say. And in all those parables, he wound up pointing us toward there's a heaven. There's a time coming when Jesus is going to come back, and some of us are going to heaven, and some are not. And they wound up as uh, two weeks ago when we were in Matthew uh, chapter 25, and we looked at that parable of the sheep and the goats, and we wound up realizing not everybody's going to heaven. Sorry, uh, even though here in America it often seems like it doesn't matter how you live, everybody's going to preach you into glory anyway. Well, that's not going to be true with God. And uh, according to the teachings of the Bible, there's more folks who will wind up in a lake of fire then we'll wind up in the glories of heaven. That's just, just what it teaches, and I know we don't like that, but that doesn't matter. It's God's Word. And we came to this place where we were studying that last parable of the sheep and the goats there in Matthew 25, and the last verse of that parable says this, verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, may your word accomplish your will. I pray, God, that you would use this time together. Not only may we worship you in song as these folks have led us so wonderfully, but, God, may it be we would hear a word from you and you would speak to us, Lord, that your word would accomplish your will. Please, God, use this time for your glory because you're worthy, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Going into everlasting punishment and eternal life. That's what it's talking about there in that last verse. And we get to the place once you've gone through all of those parables we studied, you realize the teaching, the overwhelming main topic of all those parables was Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Get ready. Well, once he's come, what's going to happen then? Once the Lord has returned, what is the next step? Well, I, uh, I hope you understand that his reason for coming is to get his bride, to get the folks who are saved and carry them out of this old world and carry us to glory itself. In John's gospel, in his writing, uh, in John chapter 14, Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. Let me share something with you, friend. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place for you and me. Wait a minute. Did y'all catch what I said? Jesus himself has declared he's going to get a place ready for us. Let that sink in. Kind of let that go down in your heart or your brain and, and wallow around a little bit. Jesus Christ is preparing a place for us. Now, I'm trying to discern, well, now wait a minute, what is he talking about? How is he, how is he planning on doing this? Let me give you a few thoughts, if I may. If we want to try to wrap our minds around the idea of what heaven is and what this prepared place is like, we got a problem to start with. Our, our, our brains don't go that way. I mean, this is too good. It's too real. It's too wonderful. And, uh, but yet, that's the direction we need to go in order to understand what Christ is telling us when he says he's going to prepare a place for us. Well, let's see now. The Apostle Paul made a comment in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Right, let that, that thought sink in. Oh, well, that's kind of foreign to us for sure. To die is gain. I mean, if I live, I'm going to live like a Christian. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to be a Christian. But if I die, it's actually going to be gain. Now, folks, we've got we to gotta, we gotta hold on right there. Do you really understand what the Apostle Paul is saying? He's declaring that to go through this valley of the shadow of death and go on is better than staying here. Um, I like it here. Do you know that? I, I'm, I'm one of these that's fat and happy, you know. I, I enjoy my, do you know what season it is? This is boiled peanut season. 
Yeah, it is. It's the time of the year when you can. I, I, I have said in times past, I don't do this anymore, but I used to. My favorite fall event was a Saturday afternoon with a, about a gallon of good, fresh, boiled peanuts, a shotgun, a, one of these round buckets that's got a swiveling seat on top of it to sit on, a radio close enough that can play, and I could back then listen to Larry Munson, and sit out on the edge of a field, and a dove fly by every now and then. Not too regular, because it aggravates me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys do. I mean, it's the fall of the year, and, and a good time. We, Lord, we're so blessed in so many ways here in America. Oh, good gracious. And, but i got to be honest with you, as good as this world is, and all the good times. Of course, y'all, you know, back then I didn't have a clue what was really good. What's really good now is to get hugs and kisses from my grand You know, that passes everything, right? I don't, know, I don't know why we had Tiffany, Kristen, and Heather. I just I ain't figured that out yet. We could just add them other ones first. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, but ain't it good to be alive? Ain't it good to enjoy this world? I mean, we are blessed in so many ways. Even on the bad days, we still got blessings. But hold on. The Apostle Paul, and he was a, he was a leader. He was a, a man of means, if you will, in his day and time, of education and understanding. But yet the Apostle Paul had the audacity to make the kind of statement we just talked about in Philippians 1.21. To live is Christ, to die is gain. What in the world can he be thinking? You know what he's thinking? He's thinking about himself and where he had been. You got your Bibles and you're willing to follow along. I want you to see this in first, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul describes himself and something that happened to him some years before. And uh, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the first five verses of Scripture, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. It is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, talk about the fact he's close to God. God does speak to him. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Now, hold on. He's being extremely honest here. This is one place in the Bible that I know of that is kind of like, is a question mark. Paul, the apostle Paul said, I knew this guy 14 years ago. Now, whether he was in the body, out of the body, in the spirit, whatever, I, I'm not sure. Paul's being real honest because you know who he knew 14 years before that? When you do your chronological uh, study of the Word of God, you find out that 14 years before he wrote the book of 2 Corinthians, he was in a place called Lystra. And he was preaching. And those folks in that town didn't like him either. And they took him outside the gates of the city and they stoned him and killed him. Now, some folks say, well, he was just, he was just knocked out. I don't think so. He's talking about himself. And laying there in the dust and the dirt outside the gates of the city of Lystra, the apostles came up. They saw him. They watched what happened, but they were scared. They saw what was taking place. And, and the, city of the, the people of the city were killing Paul. They stoned him. They threw those rocks at him until he lay in the, the dirt, bleeding and bulging and dead. And they walked off, and the apostles came up. And when the apostles got there, Paul stood up stretched, and went back into town and went back to preaching. Now, hold on. That's the guy he's talking about in these verses. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. And here's where he's getting real honest. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I can't, can't I don't know. God knows. You know what he's saying? I don't know whether he died or not. I don't know. Kind of like that fellow that I've told you all about. I'm, I won't tell you the whole story today, but you know that guy that uh, came to me and my sister in 1972 and told us about the day he died. And I sat there and listened to him and thought, you ate too much pizza, man. You know, and, and, uh, he, and he went on with it. And he, and he, he told me all that about how he died and, and all. And, and he said, and then he wound up the whole story, about 45 minutes of talking and giving us the example of what happened to him in a hospital in Albany, Georgia. And then he said, I don't know. They said they lost me. And then he told me this, and Beth, my sister, I don't really know what happened, but all I do know is this. Before that day, I was scared of dying. Today, I'm not. When he said that, eh, you know, all my junk went out the window. And when he came to the end of his life about 20 years later, 
when he was laying on his deathbed in a hospital in South Georgia and had his hands held up over his head and singing at Hank Williams Sr.'s song, Praise the Lord, no more in darkness, no more in night. Now I see the light. And he was singing about I see the light. And when his pastor told me later on what happened in that room and how he walked in there and Mr. Woods was laying there on his deathbed singing and he couldn't carry a tune in the bucket any better than I can, but yet he was singing and he was praising God and talking about seeing the light, and he died that night. Now, let me tell you something. You can go anywhere you want to. You can get all the books you want to get. You can read it. Google it any way you want to Google it. I have. I have. I, I Google it some more this week, and you can go behind some of these scientists and say, well, you know, we figured out what's happening. It's an oxygen depreciation in the brain, and because of the oxygen depreciation, you know, really dying is a pleasant thing. You don't feel the pain. You don't feel this and that. This is what doctors are saying. I'm going to be honest with you. You want to trust the doctor, or you want to trust God? I'm going to trust the Word. And in the word, the apostle Paul says, I don't know if he's dead. I don't know if I'm dead or not. I don't know. All I know is, oh, wait a minute. It goes on and says, all I know is, verse 2, such an one was caught up to the third heaven. It's right there. Brother Robert Wigley cornered me the other day and said, Brother Gerald, did you mention the third heaven in one of your sermons recently? I said, well, yeah, now that you say that, yeah, I did. He said, well... I thought it must have been you. I said, why? He said, I had a lady corner me in town and tell, ask me, point it, is there such a thing as a third heaven? And I had to tell him, yes, there is. It's in the Bible. And they didn't believe it because they said this preacher, they'd heard the preacher mention. Well, there it is right there. Y'all got your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Paul talking. He said, this guy was caught up to the third heaven. First heaven, that's where the birds fly. Second heaven, that's where the sun and the moon and the stars are at. Third heaven, glory! Woo! Y'all got that? There's three heavens. There's three heavens. I'm a going to the third. I really don't care if I ever make it to the second one or not. <laughs> that really don't bother me a whole lot. But, you know, I guess when Miss Amelia passed away, I can still remember what she said to me. So she always picked on me about wanting to go see Rome. She looked at me and said, Brother Darrell, I guess I'll just have to look at it while I go by. <laughs> Glory! You know where you're going? I'm going to just go by. But now, wait a minute. Paul's talking about himself. He said, this guy was caught up to the third. And look at the next verse. And I knew such a man. He said, I knew him. I knew him. Whether he's in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. God knows. Verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is, is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, wait a minute. The Apostle Paul is talking about himself and said, I was caught up to that third heaven. I don't understand. He admitted, I don't understand whether I was dead or alive, in the spirit, or out of the spirit. All I know is I was there. You ever had one of them experiences where you were there, and you don't know how it happened, but you know you were there? Amen. Paul had one. He was there. And he saw, and this verse of Scripture, verse 4, says it was paradise. Ain't nothing bad about the word paradise. It's good, whatever it is. It's good, I guarantee you. It's going to be happy, smiles, everything's right, the temperature's okay. It's paradise. And he said there were things that were said that you could not repeat. Verse 5 says, of such a one will I glory, yet I of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmity. Paul is trying to admit to them that there's a place called heaven, paradise, glory, and this guy that he knew, which was 14 years prior to that time, and he was in Lystra, he was the one who was stoned by the uh, jealous folk who killed him outside of town, left him in the dirt, and during the time they saw his body laying in the dirt, his spirit was not there. Do you understand the separation between the body and the spirit? When you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't understand all this. Body, soul, mind, spirit, uh, all this kind of stuff. All I know is there's more to you than what I see. I remember when I was in college and I was trying to learn some things. I had, I don't think I had but one teacher a whole time that was worth a flip. All the rest of them were 
nuts. They didn't believe in God at all, nothing. And it, it just garbage. And I can remember on one occasion I'd been trying to talk to this guy and he was a psychologist or something. And, uh, and, and we were talking, I'll never forget what he finally in his office one day admitted to me. And we were talking about the difference between the soul and the spirit and, and the body and what's really happening. And he was saying, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. When, you know what he did finally admit to me? He, said, he looked at me and said, I'll never, I'll never forget it. He said, Daryl, the one thing that I am learning is I'm convinced that doctors and medicine and science will never actually put their finger on the human mind. That's what he called it, the mind. You know where the brain is? Even according to Webster, the brain is the nervous matter contained within the cranium. Okay, a bunch of meat up there. Of course, it's really a bunch of wires, all right? You know, it's electrical. And it's, it's, it's wires, it's connections. It's a fancy computer. And uh, that's right up here. That's what this is. It really is. But the spirit, the soul, is not that. Y'all let this sink in. The real us, that spirit, that soul that is, is the real us, you do understand I can take everything you've got and take it away from you. I mean, I ain't a bad guy. I wouldn't do that to you. But I could cut your legs off and somebody else could give you another one. Cut your arms off and somebody else could cut you, take, we give you a transplant. Cut you, uh, everything you got, I can take it away from you, or maybe not me. Maybe we'll get us a doctor to do it, okay? And they can take it away from you. Your eyes, take them away from you, give you somebody else's eyes. Your, your heart. I'll never forget that day, Sylvia, when I walked into your daddy's house over there and I was sitting there. What was, this, what was the guy's name had a heart transplant? And when he was sitting there, and I didn't know him. I just went over by there to go visit Bruce for a minute. And I walked in there and I, I reached out and shook this guy's hand. And I said, how you doing, sir? And he said, I'm doing fine. I felt like a 21-year-old. I could tell he was older than me. I said, okay, another Bruce. He's going to lie to me. <laughs> And I, I never will forget, look at him, he said, well, yeah, really, I know I got the heart of a 21-year-old who's in a motorcycle wreck, and I needed a heart, and when, I, when he had the wreck, he died, and they took his heart, and he put it in me. And I said, oh, okay, you, you do understand all this is what we're doing today. They have even got, I, I could talk about every organ you got, from the liver to the kidney to the heart, uh, all this stuff, and today they can take your face. Y'all caught that one? Y'all read about that? Take your face. Do away with it and put somebody else's skin on your nose. I don't know what we'll look like. But hold on, hear me. Here's the point. You ain't got nothing we can't take away from you and replace by somebody else. Does that sink in? Except your mind. Your mind. That's you. We can make you look different. We can make you work different. I'm feeling like, I actually feel like my knee's getting better, glory. It's been nearly two years, but it's getting better. Of course, they didn't give me a knee from somebody else. Bruce Bowen, I always pick on him. I go see him, and I say, well, Bruce, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing you right. I said, how's your heart? Oh, it's good. I said, you heard it squealing lately? He has a pig valve in there. <laughs> Don't you get it? Please hear me. Our spirit, the real you is not touchable with the finger. It's not. It's invisible. It's untouchable. It's the spirit that's down inside of us that God breathes into us. And by the way, that spirit will never, never, never cease to be. We are, we are a mass of energy. I don't understand all this. They talk about how, you know, some people, Jackie Overstreet couldn't wear a wristwatch, could he? I remember this about Jackie, me and him talking that the wrist on, he would put on the watch, he put on his wrist. He had too much electricity in his body, and, and it, it would mess up his watch all the time. He always kept his watch in his pocket. It was a Timex, should have been on him, but it was in his pocket. And, but it was because he had too much electricity in his body. And I know, I'm going to get me a hex suit one day. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. Hex suit. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get one one day. I don't deer hunt anymore. I just want to be able to walk, there, walk out there and walk around them without them knowing I'm there. A hex suit. 
They got these things now that'll make you invisible to the deer. And if you watch them programs, like I watch them programs, uh, them guys are walking around the bears and the deer and the antelope and everything else, and the, and the wildlife just standing there acting like ain't nobody there. It's because of the the field of the person has been the electrical field of the person has been interrupted by this special made suit hang on we are wonderfully made people our bodies are wow and what we've got to come to the place to understand is our body and our soul and spirit are separate they're not the same if if you could tell me that your body was yours and your mind controls your body I prove you, you're wrong. Have you ever, some of you doing it right now? Oh, yes, you are. I know you. You're good folk. You're good people. I've been knowing you a long time. I love you. But there's some of you sitting in here right now, and you really and truly you're here because you want to sit there and do your appropriate thing and listen to the preacher preach the sermon. And you're going to sleep just as fast and sure as the world. Some of you. When you sit down, you shut down. I know it. I know it. And you, but now, if you do what you want to do, if your body was under your control, you know what you'd say? Wake up. I'm going to sit here for the next few minutes, and I'm going to listen to this preacher preach, and I'm not going to sleep, and I'm not going to daydream. I'm not going to wonder if the roast is burning in the oven. I'm not going to wonder if I'm going to be the last one in line at the restaurant. I'm not going to wonder about anything. I'm just going to listen to the sermon from the Word of God. And you can't make yourself do it. Your mind is drifting. You're thinking about all this other stuff. You've got all these other things on you. You know why? Because our mind is not literally physically a part of our body. It's there's something separating there. There is a difference. Please hear me. Body, soul, and spirit. That's what God's word uses to describe us. Body, soul, and spirit. Here the apostle Paul is saying that in his spirit, he ascended to glory. The third heaven saw what was unspeakable. He couldn't even describe it. I guess that's the reason all these folks say it's a bright light. It's a bright light. You ever look at a bright light? It'll blind you. You can't see it. Eventually, if you stare at that bright light, what do things are bright? If you stare at that bright light long enough, now y'all got spots all over you. And you do that, you just blind you. You can't see nothing. But now hold on. I got a tip for you. There is a glory. There is a heaven. And the apostle Paul said he went there and saw it. And after seeing it, he came back and he declared to die is gain. You got that? Let that sink in. That's important. For you and me as Christians, we believe that our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his own words in John 14, has gone to prepare a place for us. Oh, yeah. A prepared place for prepared people. If you're not ready, if you're not prepared, you remember those parables? There was that one about the marriage of the king's son. And they wound up having to invite anybody and everybody they could out of the highways and hedges and everything else out there to get folks to come in for the wedding because everybody started making excuses. And you remember the king went walking through the, the wedding party where everybody was at. And you do you remember that he looked over there and there was a guy standing over there that did not have on a wedding garment. Y'all remember that? And he saw that guy standing over there and says, Where, where'd you come from? How'd you get in here? You're not dressed for a wedding. And the king called his servants, and his servants came in there, and the king told the servants, Take this man, bind him hand and foot, and throw him out where there will be out utter darkness and the gnashing of teeth, because he was not prepared to be there. You ever heard that saying, we're going to get to heaven and we're going to wonder how they got here, whoever they are. And we're going to figure, there are going to be some folks there. You know, we've been watching them all our lives. They always went to church. They always uh, spoke highly of other folks. They were ministering to heaven. But, but we get to heaven and we notice they're not around. It's those who are prepared 
God's way. Now, bottom line, if you notice in the bulletin, we put a little outline there. And it says, how, how, do we, how do we describe the place? And I ain't even touched the description, really. And how do we get prepared for the place? Oh, man. I've got, I've got, got to do it. You do understand in the Old Testament, you get there different. Enoch. Y'all all know who Enoch was? Back in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5. He just walked with God. I don't understand all this, okay? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I believe it 100%. He walked with God, and God said, Hey, boy, we're getting along real good. Come on, let's go a little further. And he walked into glory. God took him. God took him. And then there's Elijah. You know about Elijah. He's the one, I mean, I, I, I like Elijah. All the miracles, the fire from heaven, the, the droughts, the, all the different things he did. And he gets to the end and, and uh, he's got his, his servant, Elisha, who's walking with him. And Elisha is wanting to get Elijah's blessing. Uh, and, but they all know there's something fixed to happen. It's like Elijah's going to leave and we know it. And, and, and we just got we to talk to you, Elijah. And, and they're walking down there and Elijah has his mantle, which is a, that robe, that coat, that coat. And, and he's going along there, and Elijah finally says to Elisha, Okay, okay, if you can watch me when I leave, you can get the Spirit on you. And you know what happened then? Come on. I'm going to say, God, let's do a rerun. I want a rerun. Put it on the screen. The Bible describes it like a wheel, a giant wheel with a fire, and fire in there, and stay horses you know i figure it must be a mustang ford <laughs> and his mustang comes down out of glory and and there there the wheels are on fire and the the roar of the the engine the the spinning and the turning and everything and all of a sudden elijah bows back down and gets out of the way and elijah gets caught he's loaded in and carried on i figure it's convertible and he's headed on and he drops his coat and let's Elisha have it. Now hold on. I kind of like going that trap. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, if I could have a prayer answered, Lord, send me a Mustang. <laughs> Let me catch up on that thing. Leave this world in a, in a pillar of fire headed toward glory with the sound of the engine spinning. Woo! Hallelujah. Let me, you have yours. Old Testament Enoch just walked with God and went on. Elijah walked with God and was with God, and all of a sudden God said, here come, I'm sending a, a chariot to pick you up, a, a carriage. A, uh, uh, the cab's coming to get you. Load up. Load up. Are you ready? I know. Look at the bulletin. I'll tell you about it later. All I know is I believe in God. I believe in the infallibility of this precious holy word. And this book says there is a heaven, and Paul said it's like paradise. And he'd rather die and go on and be there than walking around on earth. Have we got that kind of picture in our mind of where we're going? There's coming a day. There's coming a day. Now, if we were to take the time stop and close our eyes and look around the room or that doesn't work does it close your eyes and dream about what's been around this room the men and women of God who've gone on before us oh my oh my and they're up there now I still believe they're 33 years old someone told me they didn't agree with me I said that's okay we get to heaven, you'll find out I was right. I mean, I believe that. I mean, I, I just believe it. We're going to be like Jesus. 33 years old. I think I was in pretty good shape at 33. You know? Yeah. Won't be no babies there. I love babies to hug them, kiss them, and give them back to their mama. Won't be no babies. In I'm sorry. 
I just, they ain't going to be. They grow up. A, a, a baby that stays a baby for its life is sick. There's a problem. Won't be no old folks because I done found out getting over the hill a thing start happening in our body that just doesn't always, mm, ain't fun. And uh, you know what it's going to be? Somewhere in the middle. 33. That's a good one. 1 John chapter 5, no, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. When we see him, we shall know him and we shall be like him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And in the Gospels, it tells us what he's like. They saw him. They heard him talking. They helped him eat some fish and honey. What more can you want? They reached out and touched him. Does a ghost have flesh and bones that can be touched? What's our problem? What do you really believe? What do you really think about God? Do you believe God is able to do these things that we just passingly, quickly passed over this morning? Do you think he's able? Well, if you don't think he's able, then that means you have a limit on the personal opinion of how big God is. My God's big enough to do anything you could ever imagine and more. And he's done done it. How about your God? Is he big enough to take care of you if you'll ask him? If you'll ask him to forgive you for your sins and be your savior, he can. If you'll follow him in believer's baptism, let other folks know that you believe in the Christ of the Bible, hallelujah. Then one day, we'll walk down that street of gold and we'll have a conversation and we'll talk about what we just can't believe has really happened. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Lord, in this room, there's all kinds of needs. Lord, I know I'm not, I'm not able to meet them, but God, I know you are. And I pray that through your precious Holy Spirit, you will touch hearts and lives, that we would all realize that through Jesus Christ, we too can have the same attitude that Paul had. And we can say that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Lord, help us have that, that, that confidence in you and what you've prepared for us. And Lord, help us to make the commitments we should make so that others will know we believe in the Christ of the cross. Bless us to that end. For it's in Jesus' name I pray.